God created a good creation. We are God's masterpiece, created in God's image. God is a loving relationship of three, living for eternity in perfect harmony. One aspect of being created in the image of God is our need for loving relationships with God and one another. Everything was perfect. Adam and Eve damaged their relationship with God. They wanted to be in control, to be gods themselves. So they ate of the tree of knowledge, hoping for ultimate power so that they could have their way. When God confronts Adam, more relationships are immediately damaged as he blames Eve, who then blames the serpent. Our ancestors' sin, their neglect of loving relationships, caused things to rapidly spin out of control. God did not give up on us. Instead, God keeps trying to reestablish a loving relationship with each and every one of us. God inspires people to reveal grace, the forgiving, healing, reuniting love. We see this love in the Joseph story. His jealous brothers sold him into slavery. He endured brutal conditions, yet constantly kept loving and forgiving everyone, no matter what situation he was thrown into. In time, his grace, his ability to love and forgive, propelled him to a position of great power in Egypt. So Joseph then uses this position to forgive his brothers, to reunite his family, and to provide food for everyone in the region. Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. Then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset, and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And God is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace, and the governor of all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt. So come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen, where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and everything you own. I will take care of you there, for there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you, your household, and all your animals will starve. Then Joseph added, Look, you can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that I really am Joseph. Go tell my father of my honored position here in Egypt. Describe for him everything you have seen, and then bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin, and Benjamin did the same. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them, and after that they began talking freely with him. God never gives up on us. God sent Jesus to reveal God's love for each of us and encourages us to forgive each other, to love one another. The Apostle Paul wrote, Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ has forgiven you. 
Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Since God chose you to be the holy people God loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, making allowance for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom Jesus gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Jesus to God. We Amen. all desire loving relationships. We long to be wanted, known, heard, and understood. The greatest commandment is to build a loving relationship with God. And the second is to build loving relationships with everyone in our life. The great difficulty is we are caught between times in a fallen world. Sin has tainted everything. Nothing quite works. The whole creation groans, waiting for us to come into our complete birthright, to maturity, for us to grow until we are able to fully love each other waiting for today when we are all united in perfect love with God and one another. Between now and then, we are commanded to build loving relationships. Discipleship Journal has identified six qualities that transform relationships into loving relationships. One quality is perspective. We are all imperfect people trying to relate to other imperfect people. The church, therefore, is a group of imperfect people trying to grow and mirror God's perfect love. While it is disappointing, it should not surprise us that all people make mistakes, hurt one another, and at times seem unlovable. Perspective keeps us from becoming disillusioned and reminds us that there is beauty and love in every person. Each of us are to consider others better than ourselves. Even that person that you can't stand, that aggravates you, consider them better than yourself. You're to see that person through Jesus' eyes and to love them with Jesus' heart. We are to see others from the perspective of heaven, a beloved child of God, a priceless treasure, so valuable that Jesus died to get them back. That perspective enables us to stop looking at one another from a worldly point of view and to look at each other from heaven's perspective. Another quality to building loving relationships is humility. John Calvin calls humility the sovereign virtue, the mother and root of all other virtues. The opposite of humility is pride and self-centeredness which is what got Adam and Eve in trouble. It is the lust to be served, honored, noticed, to be treated like a god. Gary Thomas, the author of Sacred Parenting and Sacred Marriage, has this to say. At the heart of relational humility is self-forgetfulness. The world doesn't revolve around any one of us, and the demand that it should do so creates nothing but frustration. There is no good time to have a family crisis. It's never convenient to get a flat tire. Humility acts like a filter, saving us from the tyranny of grossly unrealistic expectations that everyone and everything should bend our way. 
Self-forgetfulness means we are liberated to serve others at God's direction, rather than trying to impress them. The ultimate picture of this is Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Humility comes from daily forgetting ourself and remembering God. Humility is a change of focus from self to the grandeur of God. Humility is the fountain of love and unity leading to selfless service of others. Stop labeling, start listening and taking others into account. What if a mother started evaluating her own life as meticulously as she had fallen into evaluating and commenting on her daughters? What if a dissatisfied man focused on how he was failing as a husband instead of how his spouse was failing as a wife? What if a teenager quit complaining about how his parents had messed him up and started asking himself how he is neglecting his command? To honor his parents. Humility is an essential quality to any loving relationship. Another quality is courage. Relationships are risky, messy, and it takes courage to initiate them, mend them, and deepen them. Many relationships are damaged by fears left unchecked. Fears fuel our imagination, calling us, causing us to jump to conclusions and play out worst case scenarios and to think that every thought or action or word that they say is somehow meant at us to hurt us when in reality it might not have anything to do with us. Often we know what needs to be done or said in a relationship, but we just don't have the courage to do it and do it consistently. We need courage to be honest, to love, and to seek reconciliation. We are to speak the truth in love. We need to be honest about who we are, what we are feeling, and have the courage to share that truth with one another. Sin is destructive. It hurts people and devastates relationships. Sometimes we cannot see our sin, our failure to love and be loved. So we need someone with courage to speak the truth in love, to point out how we are not loving another person. Even Peter, the rock on which the church is built, needed Paul to confront him about his negative views and comments toward the Gentiles. Do you have a negative view of someone? Scripture commands us to seek reconciliation. We are commanded to forgive when someone hurts us and to apologize when we have hurt someone else. In both cases, it takes courage to seek reconciliation. We are called to have courage, making every effort to maintain unity and peace. Loving relationships flourish on inspiration. Inspire means to breathe into, reminding us of when God breathed life into the form dust of the ground, giving humanity life. Anyone who breathes in the life and love of God is capable of inspiring another, filling them with life and love. Let yourself be inspired by others and be an inspiration to others. We are all companions on a spiritual journey. At times, we need to be inspired to take the next step. And at other times, we need to inspire another to take the next step. Inspiration flourishes when we share God sightings. Christian fellowship is iron sharpening iron. Speaking, listening, praying, and inspiring leaps of faith. If we find this difficult, then Adam Holes recommends using questions such as, what have you been learning from God these days? How did you see God at work in your life? How can I pray for you? What has gotten your attention from God's word? What promise has God given you? Share your day with another by explaining when you felt closest to God, when you enjoyed peace, love, 
grace, joy, or creativity. Strive to inspire, build up, and to add value to every person in your life so they all leave your presence a better person. Inspiration fuels loving relationships. We build loving relationships with generosity. A generous spirit believes the best about another and creates an atmosphere of welcome and safety. Generosity is sharing and providing hospitality. Pastor Matthew Woodley defines generosity as grace in action. God shows grace to us, and generosity is when we pass that grace on to others with our unmerited, generous love. Our sixth quality that builds loving relationships is attentiveness. Have you ever found yourself to be distracted when someone is talking to you? Maybe mentally formulating what you're going to say next, or drifting into a daydream, or thinking about your to-do list or your next project. Most of us find it difficult to be fully attentive. Have you noticed in scripture the attentiveness of Jesus? You get the sense that every person that came in contact with Jesus felt that they were the only person in the world as Jesus listened to them. Jesus' attentiveness enabled them to see what lay beneath their outer appearances, to hear what their heart was speaking, that their mouths couldn't even say, as Jesus did with the woman at the well. Jesus was not distracted by what others had to say, the grumblings of the Pharisees as Mary anointed Jesus' feet, the push and pull of the crowds as the hemorrhaging woman touched the hem of his garment. Jesus was attentive. Attentiveness says, I care about you. You are worth my full attention. You are precious to me. Attentiveness enables us to bear one another's burdens. Stacy Padrick writes, when we pray attentively for others, we demonstrate that we have heard them. We carry to God what they have shared, their concerns, joy, sorrows, pain, and open ourselves to any words or encouragement or scripture the Holy Spirit would give us for them. Our attentive prayers affirm the worth and wonder of individuals. We are saying, you have been intricately created by God and made in God's image. We are agreeing with God that this creation of God's is infinitely valuable, worthy of our time and full attention. And because every person is made in God's image, we might be surprised to find that when we pay attention to another, we catch a glimpse of God, and we become more attentive to God as well. So we have come full circle, back to a relational, loving God who breathes love into all of us and desires us to love God back and to love everyone. Strive to grow in the six qualities of loving relationships. Perspective, seeing others from heaven's view their beauty, and what they will become. Humility, daily self-forgetfulness, and serving others because you consider everyone better than yourself. Courage, to engage, forgive, love, and speak the truth in love. Inspiration, breathing life and love into others, encouraging them to take the next step with God, and leaving every person a better person after their time in your presence. Generosity, grace in action that loves and accepts. Attentiveness, being fully present and lifting others up to God in prayer. <clears throat> Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Let us take a moment of silence to reflect on how we will become more loving. <clears throat> 